Please be seated. So you can tell already that we're asking the question, how long? How long, O oh Lord, till these tears are gone? Think about a time in your life where you were praying and searching your soul and confiding in your trusted brothers or sisters who are telling you there's nothing they see, no unconfessed sin. And yet God still feels far away. You feel abandoned. You pray, you get no answer. You read the Bible, but the words are dry on the page. Nothing speaks. You seek God, but it feels like he's in a witness protection program. This is not a new problem, church. As we turn to this text from Psalm 13, we're invited this morning into the experience of young King David. Now David, this is the young King David, before he was corrupted by power and had his major epic failure. This is the man that God had chosen and had been anointed to be the rightful king of Israel, the leader of God's people. And yet David is not in Jerusalem. He is in the wilderness running for his life from Saul. And so he writes this prayer and repeats four times this haunting cry, How long? What we're experiencing this morning is a psalm of lament, in a service of lament. And it's right to do this. If we are biblical Christians, lament is a major theme in Scripture. All you have to do is turn to Lamentations, and you know there's the book. But even in the Psalms, a third of all the Psalms are Psalms of lament. And to lament is to express deep sorrow or grief or regret in poetry. David expresses tough emotions and lays them bare before God. David is very truthful about his feelings. Now, Psalms of lament come in two, two types. There's community psalms of lament that deal with situations of national crisis. There's 16 of those. Psalm 12 is an example of a community lament. But individual laments, there are far more of those, many written by David, uh, that address various isolated problems faced by one member of the people of God. So let's enter into David's mind and heart. He looks around at his situation and everything seems chaotic, dangerous, and his heart and mind are full of anxiety. Have you ever experienced that? Maybe you can relate to David after 18 months of being in a pandemic. Or be anxious about this transitional time in our church family. David is facing much worse. He's running for his life. He's in the middle of one of the most famous political crises in history. The succession hasn't happened, and he is the heir apparent, and he is literally afraid for his life. So he begins his psalm on a note of despair. He feels like God has forgotten him, and so he looks in vain for a way to defeat his enemies. But there is no apparent solution from a human perspective. So he turns to the Lord and prays. Now, the, these men and women like David were real people in a real place. They danced and they sang. They rejoiced and they laughed. They argued. They confessed. They lamented. And they mourned. They expressed all of these emotions to God just as we can today. 
The Psalms of Lament can guide us when our own words are not adequate to express the turmoil inside of us. The great Protestant reformer Martin Luther treasured the Psalms of Lament. Of them, he said, what is the greatest thing, let's have Luther's quote, please. What is the greatest thing in the Psalter but this earnest speaking amid the storm winds of every kind? Where do you find deeper, more sorrowful, more pitiful words of sadness than in the Psalms of Lamentation? There again you look into the hearts of the saints as into death, yes, as into hell itself. When they speak of fear and hope, they use such words that no painter could so depict for your fear or hope. And no Cicero or other orator has so portrayed them. And that they speak these words to God and with God, this, I repeat, is the best thing of all. This gives the words double earnestness and life. So let's look at the psalm for a few moments and see how David lays out his turmoil before the Lord. It falls into three stanzas of two verses each. First, David pours out the problem to God in verses 1 and 2. Then he turns that problem into a petition, into a prayer to God. And then in verses 5 and 6, there is the praise, the resolution The stanzas decrease as in in turmoil as you go through. First, David cries out in anguish. Think of him as yelling at the top of his lungs. How long, O Lord, must I cry for help? But then it ends in gentleness as God meets him in the resolution. Let's look at how that happens in verses 1 and 2 beginning there. So it seemed as if God had forgotten David. And it seems, to David at least, that this would last forever, that he would be running for his life forever. I remember when I was on a plane flying home from Madison, Wisconsin to Spokane to be home with Carrie on March 4th, 2020. There was one person in, in, on the plane wearing a mask. Remember that? That was pre-pandemic, or or at least we thought it was. I had no idea, even when I started reading about it, that this wouldn't just be a few weeks, a month at most. All of us, I'm sure, thought that at the time. I had no idea that I wouldn't be able to hug my grandchildren for months, or travel, or spend the holidays with family. I had no idea that Carrie and I would have to cancel our 40th anniversary renewal of vows with dear friends and family. And now, 18 months later, we're still in a pandemic. You see, the hard thing about waiting is you have to wait. (laughs) Now, David had a lot of time on his hands uh, he, had, he didn't have any of the levers of power. He wasn't able to do his job because he was running for his life from Saul. He was holed up in the desolate wilderness of Judah. And about all that he, could, he and his men could do was get their daily food and keep watch. So there's a lot of, there's no TV, there's no distractions, just time alone waiting. It's hard to wait. And God seems to move so slowly, at least in my experience. God says, wait. And our our human selves say, hurry. Most of us can relate to a comment by the 19th century New England preacher and author of the Christmas hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem, Reverend Phillips Brooks. Now normally, Brooks was a calm man. But one day, it's reported that he was agitated. And his friends noticed that he was in turmoil, and they asked, what's the trouble? And Brooks simply said, the trouble is, I'm in a hurry, but God isn't. See, God has a different sense of time than we do. 
We think in chronos time, chronological time, hours and minutes and days, but God is always thinking of the big picture. And sometimes it takes years or decades or millennia waiting for God. It drives me nuts. Maybe it drives you nuts too. But think about it in terms of another Old Testament character, Joseph. God had a plan for Joseph, and Joseph had an inkling of it when he was a teenager. The plan was to get Joseph to Egypt so he could be the prime minister and save not only Egypt but Israel from a famine. And that was way off into the future. So what does God do? Well, what, what would I do? I would make sure Joseph got, went, got his MBA, right? And, you know, at least got co- a business degree in college. But no, that's not what happened. Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers. He's hauled off to a foreign land. He's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and thrown into prison. And a long time goes by. I'm sure Joseph was praying something like David. How long, O Lord? Or just literally, God, get me out of here. But nothing came. There was no answer. Finally, there was an opportunity to interpret the dreams of a couple of fellow inmates. To the one man, the king's cupbearer, who was going to be released soon, David or Joseph pled with him, remember me. You know I'm innocent. Get me out of here. And the cupbearer looked him in the eye and said, I will make sure. But he forgot. Genesis 41.1 just casually says, Now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. Two more years of waiting, of anguish, of feeling betrayed by his fellow prisoner, the cupbearer. I asked the question, couldn't God have given Pharaoh the dream a little sooner? Why the long wait? All that valuable time in Joseph's 20s waiting in a prison or being a slave. David is experiencing something of the same sort. He's being prepared to be the king that Israel needs. But it's not the path that he would have chosen. Saul was pursuing him in the mountains. It had been going on for years. Where was God, David asks. Has God forgotten? Now look at verse 2. This phrase, wrestle with my thoughts, literally means adding one thought on top of the other in in an attempt to get out of the difficulty. I've done this a lot where you just start thinking of all the ways you can solve the problem. And your thoughts start tumbling out. And then you realize none of them will work. And you just get even more in despair. All night long, David would probably have a sleepless night, and he'd make his plans. And each day he would try them, but they were all futile. And all he got for his trouble was more grief. David had gone from hope to despair so many times that he felt like he was on an emotional roller coaster or a rat in a maze without an exit. He felt like God had just dropped him there and walked away. In David's mind and heart, Saul was still the king, and he was tempted to think that the anointing of him was just a cruel joke. David was suffering while Saul was enjoying the comforts of the palace. And what makes it worse is Saul is evil. (laughs) The Spirit of the Lord had departed from him. He is wreaking havoc in Israel with his actions. Didn't God know what was happening? Couldn't God do something? Well, sooner or later, we all experience something of what David did. The pandemic has been an extended time of suffering. We have lost loved ones. Millions of people around the world have died of COVID. The disruption to our economy, to our politics, to our churches is enormous. 
We call out to God, but we're still in wearing masks. <laughs> We try to figure out how to get out of our circumstances. Nothing works. We go from the heights of hope when there's a vaccine to the depths of despair at the inability of people to get the vaccine. So when when we experience suffering like David, like Joseph, there are three important biblical truths to remember. First, God invites us to lament. Lament is the biblical framework to pour out our deepest emotions to God. God teaches us in these lament psalms, in Lamentations, in Habakkuk, in Job, throughout the scriptures, how to pour out whatever we're feeling to him. Second, we know from scripture an amazing truth. God has not forgotten us. Isaiah 49 says, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and the Lord has forgotten me. And God answers, Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. So we may suffer even for years, but God has not forgotten He cannot forget. He numbers the hairs on our head. God says in Hebrews 13, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So when we look in Scripture at Joseph and David and others who seemingly God has forgotten, that's not what happened. God is working in them to build their maturity, to build their trust in him, to continually call them to to their knees to pray. When I was a kid, we had four oak trees in our yard, and two of them were large, majestic trees, older than my grandparents, and two were from acorns. They were just babies. Many, many years later, we were living in Minnesota, and We went to visit my parents for the holidays, and I was able to show those oak trees to my kids, and they were huge. Those little oaks had grown into mature trees just like their parents. It takes years, decades, to grow a sturdy oak tree, and the same thing is true in us. It takes years for God to form spirit-led character in our lives. But many Christians don't grow to maturity. They aren't able to experience the power of the Spirit working through them. Because when God seems distant, instead of calling out to him with all their emotions, that's fine with God, they shrug their shoulders and say, oh well, and they read a self-help book or they comfort themselves with distractions. David didn't do that. When God seemed distant, he called on God to answer him. He insisted that God respond. Instead of turning from God, he turned to God. Instead of complaining to other people about God's lack of responding, David complained to God about other people. Matthew Henry put it like this, we should never allow ourselves to make any complaints but what are fit to be offered up to God and what drive us to our knees. When we feel God is distant, that's especially the time to seek him earnestly. And David knew this. He was sensitive to the presence of God in his life. And when he lost that sense of God's presence, he went after it with all of his might. See, the test of our faith is not when God's presence is very real to us. It's not when we see God's power at work in our lives. The real test of our faith is when God seems distant. If you seek God, you will find him. So call upon the Lord, especially when God feels distant. 
Secondly, you have to keep an awareness of God and the enemy always before us. Derek Kidner, Old Testament scholar, writes of this psalm, awareness of God and awareness of the enemy is virtually the hallmark of every psalm of David. It's the positive and negative charge which produce the driving force of his leadership. Howard Hendricks says it this way, when you are doing what Jesus Christ has called you to do, you can count on two things. You can stake your life on it. You will possess spiritual power because you have the presence of Christ, and you will experience opposition because the devil does not concentrate on secondary targets. He never majors on the minor. What happens when we go through this lament, as David does, is that we come to the end of ourselves. We become helpless before the Lord. God allows that so that we will turn to him and rely on his strength. David was fearing for his life. In the psalm it says, uh, literally, make my dim eyes sparkle again or give light to my eyes and for the hebrews dim eyes were a sign that our vital powers are growing dim and that death was approaching and bright eyes are the sign of life david calls out to god enlighten my eyes make my dim eyes bright we're going to stop there before we resolve david's dilemma And we're going to have a time to experience our own lament before the Lord. Lindsay's going to lead us now with her team in a time of corporate and individual lament. So this next part of our service is going to involve interactive prayer. We're going to begin with a time of silent prayer together with Bert and Luann leading us. And then after that, there will be a time for you to sit and silently reflect the same for you at home. And for those of you who are here, we would encourage you to come forward. We recognize that the process of coming forward can be awkward, but we have this yoke We want you to bring your laments to the Lord who invites you to come. If you choose not to, it's okay. It could be awkward, people walking, coming across you, maybe once or even twice, but it's like lament. It's varied and different for each one of us. Let's give each other grace in how we respond today and in our laments. This time is for you to be with the Lord, so we encourage you to go at your own pace and to do what feels comfortable for you. So let's quiet ourselves and now turn towards God in prayer. Oh, Father, thank you that you never leave us or forsake us, that you always hear us. Jesus, thank you for your promise that when two or more are gathered, you are here. And Holy Spirit, we invite you to move in us, give us courage, search our hearts, and help us release our laments. Lord, we lament the many difficult events of this season. We grieve the many deaths, extended illnesses, and financial hardships caused by COVID. We grieve the division over race and politics in our nation, our churches, and our families. We grieve the deaths in our own church, and the departure of key leaders. 
we silently lift our own griefs to you, Lord. How long, O oh Lord? Lord, we are bewildered and disoriented as we try to reconcile your deep love for humanity with the suffering we endure and watch. We are unsure how to make an effective response we silently express our confusion to you. How long, O oh Lord? Lord, we are angered by many things that anger you, by injustice, by suffering inflicted one upon another, by the lack of honor given to you. We silently give our own anger to you. How long, O oh Lord? Now in silence, Lord, we lament and confess our own sin in the midst of these situations and in response to these situations. Please hear our silent confessions. Thank you for hearing us, Lord. Amen. So we invite you now to spend the next 10 minutes in personal reflection of your own laments before the Lord. and want to encourage you to also respond. To help you in this process, we suggest that in addition to reflecting, that you also name your lament and write them down. Maybe it's just a word. It might be a phrase, maybe even just a symbol, something between you and the Lord. If you are online, this is where you'll use your pencil and paper and follow the prompts on your screen. 
And then for those of you here in person, after you have spent time reflecting and written down your laments, we invite you to come forward and to place your lament here in the yoke. Please know this is just between you and the Lord and no one will read these. And then you may return to your seat. But might I encourage you to go and see a prayer minister. They have a symbol to give you as a reminder that the Lord carries our burdens with us. And if you wish, they'd love to pray a blessing over you. If you prefer to stay in your seat, I want to encourage you to do this process and release your laments to the Lord, knowing that he is here with you in this. If you're unable to come forward, we'll have prayer ministers looking out, and you can wave, and they'll come over to you and receive your lament and bless you with the words of Jesus. At the conclusion of our time, I'll call us back together and we'll join in a song with one another. And Randy will continue his sermon. So to start our time now, I invite the prayer ministers to come forward and invite you all to start by placing your laments in the yoke and then take your place around the sanctuary. Be blessed as you reflect in this time with the Lord.
If you're still moving about, feel free to continue to do that. For the rest of us, let's stand and sing together. You can take a seat. And now I finish Psalm 13 with verses 5 and 6. But I will trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Nothing's changed in David's situation. He's still fleeing from Saul. But something has changed in his spirit and his soul and in the depths of his heart. He has come to trust in the loving kindness, the unfailing love, the chesed of God. And a calm assurance has come over him. And his heart is full of joy as he thinks of the deliverance that God will come, will come into his life with. So by faith, 
Not by sight, David counts God's past deliverance as future and says, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. David has changed his focus from his problems, his pain, his anguish. And by worshiping God honestly, pouring out all of the emotions in his heart, he was led to a new place. God met him and comforted him and changed him. He goes from confusion and even depression to joy and praise. And every person who does this has their own journey of lament. It's interesting that some of the lament psalms have no resolution. And that's okay. We can meet God wherever we are. Every time we suffer and are tempted to despair, we will be attacked. But we turn to scripture like Romans 8, where we read that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God. Joseph came to the end of his life. He looked at his brothers, who he had been reconciled with, and he affirmed that they had wronged him. And they meant it for evil, but God used it for good. God meant it so that Joseph could learn to trust in God's loving kindness. Now this Hebrew word that we get trust from in verse 5 has this nuance of relying or leaning on someone or something. I love this picture, this art, leaning on Jesus. And that's what we can do with God. He is always welcoming us. His heart is for us, to transform us, and to increase our trust. So if you are sensing that God is distant, call out to him. Trust in his unfailing love. Remember that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Let's conclude by reading together these words from Matthew's Gospel. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's continue our worship now in a time of prayer.